Hello. Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. I've ditched the headset today for what, in my opinion, is a much more fitting piece of attire. Hopefully this sounds all right coming through on the microphone. This one, courtesy of our friends down at Alma College, the Scots, hooked it up after a visit uh, earlier this week. Shout out to the boys and Coach Couch and company down there. Great hospitality from those guys. So I'll, I'll do it for the intro here, and then we'll we'll go back to the, the usual for the rest of the episode. But had, before we get started in this one, this is uh, episode 168 in the night of July 1st. Got a great guest joining me, not from Alma, but from UTPB, the team on fire down there in Texas. Kenny Hernster is the youngest coordinator in college football right now after an electric year for the Falcons last year at quarterback under center for those guys. But uh, back to Alma, went down there. You guys saw some of the stuff on Instagram or the social. But we will be having a special edition of the podcast coming out very soon with Coach Couch and myself right down there at uh, in Alma. And then uh, be on the lookout for a facility tour with those guys, some more content, even a game day walk wearing the kilt with Coach Couch. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline, hopefully in the next week or so here from that trip. Once again, thank you to them uh, for having us. Really excited to hopefully go out and do more of that in the future, but for tonight's episode, what do we have going on? As I smack the microphone with my face mask, I'm not used to being this far away from it. There's a big change potentially coming to the Division II playoffs. We're going to talk about it. It's something I've campaigned for for a very long time when it comes to the Super Regions and just totally abolishing them, get throwing them out the window. How about what D3 football teams have the best transfer portal classes coming in this fall? Hard to find much info on it, but we've got a pretty uh, decent ranking, a top 10, if you will, from across the country. And then finally... Today is July 1st. July 1st means new fiscal year. For any of you who work in, I don't know, any kind of different business sectors, but in college athletics, the new fiscal year is a big deal because that's when a lot of new contracts and other things start. And that means that there are teams officially moving levels, whether it's from D3 to NAIA, D3 to D2, NAIA to D2. We've got teams across the board jumping around and making those moves official as of today that I want to talk about in this episode. So thank you all for tuning in. I'm really excited about this one. If you're on YouTube, hello, you can see this uh, lovely helmet on my head right now, but uh, use those timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the episode, fast forward any part of the episode you'd like to listen to. Otherwise, those video chapters will be in the description on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this pod. Follow us on the socials. Let's get right into the conversation with coach Kenny Hernser. Join the show tonight. From what we know, he's the youngest coordinator in college football. He's heard that a lot over the last uh, couple weeks here. A title he's certainly earned down at the University of Texas at Permian Basin. QB's coach, pass game coordinator for the Falcons, Kenny Hertzer. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Dude, just excited to get you on here. And uh, you're someone who, this happens quite a bit. We've talked about you a lot on this particular program. Good to have your face uh, blessing us on this program. And we get to talk to you and not about you this time around. I'm excited for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. But what a turnaround for you. Congratulations, first of all, on your new role. Has it really, I guess, kind of sunk in for you and you've been moving? I guess my first question is, like, from the outside, you see that offensive coordinator, that title put on to you in this position. Is it really that different for you these la this last month or so since getting that title, or is it a lot of business as usual down there? It's really business as usual. Um, you know, we still have – our other offensive coordinator, Blake Crandall, too, and, uh, you know, Chris McCullough calling the shots. So, you know, I'm just excited for the title. But, you know, every everyone kind of works together as we're all one group. And so, uh, you know, just really working with these coaches, learning more each and every day, just more about the offense that I didn't understand as a quarterback, learning it on the coaching side now. 100%. You've played in this offense for even longer than you've been at uh, UTPB. We'll talk about that that journey a little bit. So if there's anyone that's obviously familiar with it, I know Coach had talked about that in the past, that you're the man for the job. Now, outside of coaching off the field, you also just got married, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, Congratulations, sir. man. That is awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dude, Thank it's you. just life is moving for you right yeah. now. Have you had the chance to just, I mean, soak this all in and kind of take in this time in your life where – Things, first of all, are just trending up, but there's just so much going on right now. Yeah, everything's moving really fast. I haven't got really the time to just settle down and kind of enjoy it yet. But, um, you know, I know that day's coming. Uh, but, yeah, I got married in early May. Uh, okay. We went on a little honeymoon for about a week, came back, and then we were in the floor running. So, in the <laughs> coaching and everything's going good now. And she knows exactly what she's signing up for. 
<laughs> yeah, she does. She does. She does. She does. And I heard you talk. Uh, she gets to call some of the shots too. I heard you talk on uh, one of the different shows that uh, you know the flow, the long hair was not coming back potentially because of uh, one of her decisions. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. I, I try to make a few decisions, but you know sometimes they get turned down. Good for you, brother. Growing up fast. I love it, dude. Yes, I love it. Um, that is that is great. Um, but let's talk about your journey with Coach McCall. And I had mentioned, you know, you talk about you knowing this offense very well. And coming over from East Central where you've played in that role, you've experienced a lot of success. You come over and pick up right where you left off in this uh, in this offense under him. From Ada, Oklahoma to the Basin, you guys seem to, to have some, some great success wherever you're at, man. Now you're on his staff contributing in a big way to a really successful team. How would you describe your relationship with him? And then how's that that's evolved over the last couple of years in different spots? Yeah, no, uh, great guy, a guy I can truly trust, and, uh, you know, a guy I know who's going to put me in the best situations possible. Uh, playing for him was great, uh, you know, kind of started out as just a quarterback's coach whenever I first got there, and then as he moved up in coaching, you know, play, just kept playing for him, loving it. Uh, he asked me to come down to Odessa, and, uh, you know, it was one of the best decisions on and off the field that I could have made. But again, he's just—he's always been there for me. A guy that is gonna have—he's gonna have my back. He's gonna have all his players' backs at all times. So, uh, just a guy you can truly be around and trust, and really just lives the family culture that he preaches every day. Everyone loves to talk about family, right? College football—that might be the buzzword of the century. Yeah, family, <laughs> yes, sir. Family, family, and it's like. When you find guys that that live it and breathe it, right? That's that's important. That you you tend to try and stick around those guys. Now he's someone that's earned a lot of recognition. I notice I say earned and not just gotten, right? He certainly mm -hmm. has deserved that. Do you walk around the facility? Does he drop any like you find yourself uh, catching any like good nuggets of info or different uh, things that you've just picked up from him? Some things that maybe you hadn't thought about before. Yeah, really. Since since my short time coaching, uh, you know, I just learned so much more on this side of the ball that. I didn't, I didn't realize really as a player, you okay. know, things I didn't maybe didn't agree with as a player, but now I, I understand everything has a purpose behind every decision. And, gotcha. you know, there's so much more into being a head coach than just football. So trying to pick up on that aspect just for the future. You have had coaching aspirations somewhere down the line? Somewhere down the line. I know yeah. that it's a long way, long way away. So I'm just going to learn from everybody I can right now. Never know, man. Sometimes the, the right spot, right opportunity pops up. You can be the man for the job. But like you said, head coaches now more than ever, uh, you got the one hat on right now. Multiply that by about you know 10 or 15, and mm -hmm. you're looking at the usual head coaching job. I think, yes. once again, from an outsider's perspective, it becomes increasingly less and less desirable uh, of exactly. a position for a lot of different guys. But glad to hear we still have some guys that, uh, that want to take on that role and, and lead their own program, man. But uh, you're not the only guy from last year's squad to exchange the cleats for a whistle. Talk about uh, Matt and Hayden having them go through this process with you, albeit obviously in different roles, but still making that same transition nonetheless. Oh, it's great. I mean, since... Since the day we had to put the cleats up, we were in the office the next day and uh, <laughs> having awesome. those two guys with me, man, they've been awesome. You know, we're all learning together, learning different things from these coaches and, you know, just having some buddies that you already knew that, you know, you love to share the field with, to share an office is great too now. Um, and with this young staff too, it's, you know, everyone just gets along. Everyone's having fun together. We enjoy going to hang out outside the office. So having those two guys around really helps everything. I like that a lot, dude. That's something that not a lot of people get, right? That's a that's a mm -hmm. privilege to, to be in that spot. And I guess this kind of goes back to Coach McCall and talking about, you know, what is it besides the obvious of winning football games that makes that decision and this opportunity such an easy one for guys like you and those guys and in that same situation to want to stick around and, and stay in this building for a longer period of time? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is just that competitive edge we have. Uh, you know, you, you don't get that in your – everyday desk job. So just being around the game that we love, um, you know, especially right now, living through our teammates that we played with last year, our buddies that we were hanging out with last mm -hmm. year, that they're still succeeding on that field and there's nothing better than watching that. Um, you know, still friends to the day I die and I can't, I can't wait to watch these other guys succeed. And then just, I, you know, I, I gonna, I'm going to keep talking about it, but that family culture of just being around people who want to win uh, being around competitive people, you know, we're, 
And whenever we do get away from the office, we're going and playing pickleball and golf and trying to get as okay. you know as good as we can at those sports now. So yeah, I think it's just it's just a great time, just competing and everything we do. How is the pickleball game? It's it's all right. Okay, it's all right. I'm I'm sure not a pickleball player, but I try. <laughs> That's good. I mean, golf's golf's the easy one. Like everyone, you know, kind of get in that, and it's a fun, you know, have have a couple uh, adult beverages with the fellas. But you get out to a pickleball match, depending on the day, with the with the right guys, and and you're leaving maybe less friends than when you showed up to the court. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I yep. love that, dude. And you talk about those guys that just a year ago you're on the roster with, and the question always is, oh, how do you navigate that and, and go from a player to a coach? You're not the first guy to be in those shoes. I'm sure you'll navigate that. But I think when you talk about the competitive nature inside of that, now you're talking about you're coaching a guy that you were competing, you know, for a spot last year against. Mm-hmm. You're a dude who you shared the room with. And so that competitive side of you and wanting to get the absolute most out of all these guys because you know what they're capable, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And then you practice against those defensive guys, right, every single day. And so – I, I think from a competitive side, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's got to be more competitive juices flowing than ever with, with the kind of guys in your shoes. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, you know, like our starter this year, Dylan Graham, he's he's a few months older than I am. Yeah. And so just, Crazy. you know, being with that guy, it's awesome. And But we all have the same common goal. Our goal is to win some more games, go 1-0 and every week. And then, But, you know, you have your personal goals too, and there's nothing better than him beating every record from last year and every record in his school history. That just – it just means he did amazing as a player, and I did my job as a coach too. So and there's no, there's no bigger fan of his than mine, and, and that goes for every quarterback in our room. I, oh, yeah. I love seeing him throw touchdowns on the same guys we were throwing touchdowns on last year. So <laughs> yes, it's a lot of fun. Dude, I love that. Oh, that is great, man. Spoken like a true coach, man. You are you are hitting all the – <laughs> All the points too. I mean, you got even slid in the one of you know goals to go one and zero every week, and you're hitting all the you're hitting all the right points, dude. I I, I love it. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> it's good. It's good, man. Uh, going into last year, you knew that coaching was going to be in the picture for you. Now, whether you knew what your title was going to be or you'd be at that, you know, probably figured out a lot of those things. But you knew that coaching was going to be in the picture for you. <laughs> Going into the games, practices, different things and uh, different events, those kind of deals last year, did you approach that at all differently or maybe from a different perspective, knowing you'd be on the other side of the ball, or was it just taking advantage of the last year of eligibility you had and then see what uh, see how the cards fall? No, it was really just, you know, see how much fun I could have this last year. Wow. Uh, came in, met a lot of new guys that were so welcoming, brought me in, at, treated me like family from day one, and so – I was like, man, I I only have another few months of this, so I'm going to make the most of it as I can. And then once coaching comes, you know, we'll deal with that from there. But I made some friendships on this team that will last forever, so I'm I'm really happy with that. And then I think it kind of speaks to now coaching. These guys, they've been great with me, Hayden, and, uh, you know, Matt. They're they're respecting us. They're, you know, they're treating us like coaches now, and – but, you know, still, they're still going to come in our office and talk like we're players sometimes, too. So it's Love great that. just being around these guys and always watching them grow. That is awesome, dude. And I, I like that a lot. And, uh, you know, you talk about that. Not uh, not anyone in that building, I'm sure, is sweating over any uh, preseason rankings because, you know, you're in the <laughs> coach role. You don't, who gives a shit about that, right? But mm-hmm. you guys are featured, top 20, heading into this fall, maybe a little lower than some would have expected. And you look at that roster, especially, you know, talking about the offense because that's what the, goes, the guys you'll be working with. You return a lot of spots, a lot of big-time uh, key players at those skill positions, whether it's in that wide receiver room or in the offensive backfield, that running back. Obviously, even have a dude at quarterback who has uh, been in the system. It's not someone who's going to be brand new to what you have going mm-hmm. on. What are some of the things that uh, you look to see them improve on, whether it's – you know, something on or off the field going through these uh, first couple months gearing up for fall camp? Yeah, I'm excited to watch them. I mean, we're definitely more talented this year all the way around okay. on both offense and defensive side. We got some really good transfers in. That transfer class was top in the D2 level. Um, but just watching these guys gel in the spring, and I'm, I'm super excited to watch them go compete in the fall too. Just help out where I can. You guys have not shied away from the portal at all, and that's been a constant, at least um, in Coach McCullough's case, on either spot, and it's certainly helped you guys a lot, right? You've, it's paid <laughs> off in dividends, and when I think when you have, you, you talk about the culture and the family and the things that are instilled in, inside of a program, do you find that these guys come in and they get with the program almost right away or else they're not the right fit? How does that work? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you can kind of tell within the first few weeks of 
if a guy's going to buy in or not. Okay. And if he's not, he's not going to fit our team, and he's not just not going to do it here for us. So we look for guys, and you can you can tell on their visits too, guys that want to come here and work hard. And I think we've we've done a great job of getting talent here, but most importantly, we've done a great job of guys that want to buy in and want to win games. I think at the end of the day, everyone's had that has that same common goal of just win. You know, like we talked about each and every week, and then the individual accolades will come after that. So if you win, it's gonna you're gonna take care of business. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for your time tonight, dude. You look sharp. Awesome, man. You got a lot of stuff going on for you right now and, and on and off the field. I'm super excited for you and just just where you're at in life, man. It, it is awesome for you to, to have these opportunities and thank you for uh spending a little bit of time with me tonight talking some ball. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me. Of course. Have a good night, Kenny. Yes, sir, you too. See ya. Huge thank you to Kenny for joining me tonight. Excited to talk with him and talk about just a dude at a point in his life where there are so many awesome things going on at the same time. Super excited uh, for him and everything he's got going on down there on and off the field. But tonight, special night. How about the uh, first ever featured athlete on this show? And uh, if you guys saw on our social media platforms we put out there, if you want your film featured on the show, there's a couple different categories um, that you can get on here and have your film and other attributes showcased in front of over 250 college coaches that follow our accounts and, and I, that I know tune into the show. It's become part of their routine. Uh, how about tonight, though? We are talking about an outside linebacker, a graduate from Lenore Rhine. That is Percy King, 6'2", 205. He was named the All-Piedmont Defense in 2023 in the sack. And uh, throw up a little bit of the film, a little bit of the highlights here for you guys to uh, tune in while I talk about this guy for just a little bit here. And uh, in his career there at Lenore Ryan, he had 11 interceptions as an outside linebacker. Four of them returned for Tuds. That was a school record for the Bears. That's pretty impressive. How about 146 tackles in his career, 80 of them being solos? 14 and a half TFLs for 47 yards lost, a sack, 24 passes defended as a linebacker, and that's something I'll talk about uh, with him, at least when I got the sense of watching this film. The dude's very comfortable playing outside in the box in space. He can come quickly in downhill to stop the run, but you'll see in a lot of these clips, he split out very far in an area where a lot of outside linebackers might be put on an island by uh, slot receivers and other offensive skill positions to put him out there and uh, create a mismatch. Percy is not that guy, at least from what I can tell watching the film. He's a patient player, trusts his instincts, quick to read, make decisions, especially when he's coming downhill. You'll see a couple of those clips here disrupting the plays, whether it be in the backfield or all the way down in the defensive backfield on the other side of the field. You'll get another good look at that here, taking that one back the other way. Uh, so 24 passes defended as a linebacker. Again, that's just a ridiculous number for a dude that has so much experience in that part of the game. A forced fumble also in his career kind of rounds out the stats for him. Like I mentioned, was an all-conference selection this last year. And uh, I think most notably, this is just a dude that has played a lot of football at the college level. He's played in 40 games during his college career. That is a dude with a ton of experience, a great skill set. So shout out to Percy for being our first highlighted athlete on uh, on Division One Rejects. I appreciate uh, you trusting us to get your stuff out there. And uh, like I said, for anyone else looking to uh, be featured on the show, you know where to go. That came out a lot smoother than anticipated. That was a bar. Okay, awesome. But moving forward into the small school news for tonight. I alluded to it earlier, Division II football, potentially a big change coming in the way that we operate our playoff format. This is the tweet that I saw that kind of sparked uh, this conversation for me. And, uh, you know, Commissioner over there at MIAA, he tweets, and oh my gosh, the text is so small. I have to pull it up on uh, on my separate screen over here because I can't even read it. But you guys can hopefully see that. Hold on, let me do a little Zoom job. There we go. There we go. Figured it out. Figured it out. All right, Mike Racy, the commissioner over there at uh, the MIAA, he says, uh, it's a quote from D2. He's just aggregating here. The D2 Championships Committee is recommending the Management Council eliminate bylaw 18.4.3.1. <laughs> which requires sport committees to pair teams strictly within their region. I'm going to say that again. Which requires teams strictly, or committees to pair teams strictly within their region as the group works to enhance regionalization bracketing model. Hello. That would be very big news. He says, this is great progress and a hopeful sign to a better selection process and bracketing system for future D2 championships. Hell yeah, it is, Mike. And I've appreciated, for one, Mike's transparency, not on this, but just everything when it comes to his position and uh, kind of the things he hears. Um, he's not obviously like 
There's no insider scoops. But what he does, he doesn't gatekeep any of this information. He's out there. He's very transparent with this stuff. I appreciate the hell out of it because then I get to talk about it on this particular show. So for a lot of people, they might wonder what I'm talking about. Most people understand, right? Uh, Division two football, you go into super region. So in Division two football, it's not like just the top four teams in the country. Or in this case, the top, it would be what? 28 teams in the country just make the playoffs. I know, that seems way too simple. Not how it works. The top seven teams in each super region make the playoffs. So if teams, if, if, if say, this will never happen, but see, for, this, for the sake of example, the top 10 teams in the country are all in super region number one. Guess what? Only the top seven are making it to the playoffs. No excuses, no exceptions. That's bullshit. This was the, uh, this was the bracket for last year's uh, playoff, national playoff, if you will. And... Um, this just kind of shows you at least what the current model is kind of like. There's Super Region 1, Super Region 3 on the right, and then down here, Super Region uh, 2 and 4, respectively, uh, taking a look at that and the runs. Obviously, Harding uh, finishing up, cleaning up house there with the National Championship game. But when you look at this, what jumps out to you, right? What jumps out at you? And I'm going to pull up the uh, final AFCA rankings. That's the American Football Coaches Association. They do uh, some pretty accredited rankings for Division II football. We're going to pull up the final rankings from D2 football. And again, I've talked about this before. No one's going to be surprised by this. Let's look at Super Region 3, okay? And I'm going down the AFCA rankings while I'm looking at this. Number one in the final rankings, obviously, Harding, Super Region 3. Okay, number two, School of Mines, Super Region 4. They played in the championship. Deserved. But then you go down, number three, GVSU, number five, Pittsburgh State, number six, Central Missouri, number nine, Ferris. And now we've just gone down this list where you have one, two, three, four, five of the top 10 teams in the country are in Super Region 3. And yes, they all made the playoffs, thankfully, but now you're talking about the teams in Super Region 3 that are just off the cuff. Teams like Davenport or teams like, you know, whoever else. I can make that argument, right? And uh, it's frustrating. And so now you say, okay, you know, there was some news that came out semi-recently that there was potential for new super regions. And I'll show you guys the proposed new layout that is supposed to be taking place in 2025. This is a look from uh, Reddit College Football here. And you'll see it, what it doesn't do is abolish the super region system. It's just changing the conferences that coincide with each super region. So now, instead of Super Region 3 having the Great American Conference and the MIAA, they bring in the GMAC and the NSIC, which are the teams in the green, for those of you looking at the map on YouTube right now watching this episode, right? And... Um, this map, the thing they try to do here, I'll show, I'll show you this map, and then this next map I'm going to show you is, you can see it in the bottom right, this is the model that's been used since 2017, and I, you can see that green region is like, what, like what is going on here? I don't know if how much geographical sense that actually makes, and then we've got a blue dot all the way in that sea of orange dot, it's just an interesting kind of situation we have here, so I think their updated model is just trying to fit more of an actual geographic landscape, and they've done a better job, honestly, they have done a better job, it makes sense geographically, the system still sucks. So, you know, Kobe, that they fixed the geographic problem, what's the issue with this? The issue has nothing to do with geography, everything to do with the system, but just to, to put out Right, a great example of this. Look at Super Region number four, right? The gray teams, all the ones all the way on the left. Conference isn't there. Great American Conference, Lone Star Conference, MIAA, and the RMAC. What jumps out right away? Great American Conference, Harding, RMAC, Mines. That was your national championship game this year. With these Super Regions adopted, right? With those Super Regions adopted, if we go back to uh, this year's bracket from this past year, that was Super Region... Which one was it? That was Super Region 4. So you'd be down here in the right corner. Mines is already in there. So say they are the one and two seeds in that Super Region. They're going to meet at the latest, at the latest in the quarterfinals. That would be a quarterfinal matchup. So it was a championship game that given those circumstances that were supposed to be implemented or are supposed to be implemented in uh, 2025, I do believe, because Coastal Carolina is coming in as a conference, a whole other conversation. That now would be just a quarterfinal game. That 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 everything that is wrong with Division Two football playoffs. So this news, going back to the original kind of note here from Mike about the NCAA, I'll have you guys just uh, take a read on this one one more time. 
they've recommended that they eliminate that bylaw, which is requiring them to schedule within these regions and could open up the bracket to all kinds of new possibilities and to more just making sense, if we're being honest here. So that is really big news for Division Two football. I wanted to cover that because it's something I've talked about a lot in this show, and I think that would be a great addition to the sport. Now, let's move over to Division Three. Nothing to do with the playoffs. Everything to do with the top transfer portal classes. This list compiled by our friends over at Athlinked. Uh, this shows off, in their opinion, using their databases and stats, which I, I will say are pretty thorough, it seems. This is compiling what they believe are the best transfer portal classes heading into the fall of 24. So for those of you just listening, we got Grove City, UW-Whitewater, Hardin-Simmons, Randolph-Macon, and Lacrosse actually rounding out the top five there. And what you'll notice about all these teams, like all the teams on this list, just about all the teams on this list are like contenders. Right? Like you're not, I think in, in Division Two and Division One, sometimes you get some big time transfer portal classes from uh, guys at bigger schools who are transferring down and get a lot more playing time. Like these are guys that are benefiting, these are teams, excuse me, that are benefiting from lar- people at larger schools transferring down to do that same thing, but at a high level Division Three football team. All of the, Most of these teams uh, kind of fit that bill. Going on the rest of the list, though, number six, Johns Hopkins. You got Aurora, John Carroll, Mary Hart Baylor's on this list. Nichols was kind of a surprising one. Maryville, Mount Union, Baldwin Wallace, Cortland up there, and uh, Centery and Framingham State. That rounds out the top 10. Now, I'll tell you what. I tried to do a little bit of research here. I tried to figure out, okay, Grove City's number one, Whitewater's number one. What makes these classes the best? I'm just trying to go out and do some Googling, did some research earlier today. I'll tell you one thing, and if I know one thing, it is so hard to find good information on small school transfers and small school football and news in that regard. I would love to be the platform that breaks all that news for you guys, but damn it, I can't find shit. I can't find anything. It is really hard. Um, I did find... Uh, Grove City at least posted kind of like a thread of some of the new guys on their Twitter that they uh, were planning on adding here this fall. And so it looks like you've got a defensive back from Utica that they're excited to have. How about a defensive back from Baldwin Wallace, a wide receiver from Susquehanna that's got a big-time build, 6'3", 230. Um, so that's just some of the guys that they're bringing in. How about a linebacker and DB from Bucknell? So talk about a bigger, uh, higher level coming down to the D3 level. Keystone College bringing in a kicker. And then Salisbury, they've got a DB coming from there. So um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a spread, right? And not too many of the larger schools kind of taking advantage of that regard. But that's what I could find from Grove City. Whitewater's got a DB coming in from Bemidji, it looked like, and a couple other guys that I could find. But it was, it was kind of sparse looking for news there. UW Lacrosse seems like one of the bigger uh, additions kind of on this list is a big-time tight end and quarterback transfer duo from Southwest Minnesota State. The tight end, I know, had quite a bit of uh, uh, expectations coming into the portal there. I had seen a, quite a bit of production. And then um, UWL, we talk about lacrosse. Kaiser Heltebrand is out of the picture over there. So that quarterback transfer could be a very timely one for Matt Janis and company over there in Wisconsin. So that's what I saw, at least from kind of that top five. I couldn't find too much on Randolph or uh, Harden Simmons, at least. You know, it's just, it's just so difficult to find these things. But there's your list. That's uh, supposedly the top 10 transfer portal classes uh, coming into the fall here, 24 for Division Three football. We'll see if this has any bearing on what these teams do. And, uh, or I shouldn't say top 10. This is top 16. I, I messed that one up royally. Um, but this is... Uh, We'll see if this has any bearing on the season and, and how these teams kind of perform and, and what kind of uh, impacts those those the transfer additions make. But let's close off this episode, shall we? We got uh, teams making the jump in divisions. Let's start with the Division Three team that was in the past NAIA is actually making the jump back into the NAIA ranks. That is Defiance College. There you have the uh, kind of officially, they say officially official. That is their uh, official announcement there. Defiance is joining the Wolverine Hoosier Athletic Conference, the WAC, W-H-A-C, uh, for those of you who are big into acronyms. Let's just say this. That's a tough That's a tough conference. That is a very, very tough conference. And uh, this team, or I shouldn't say this team when it comes to football, but this athletic program had been participating in, in the NAIA for quite some time. Um, they transitioned to Division Three in 1991. So they've been in D3 for quite a long time now, at least uh, over 20 years, over 30 years, excuse me. And now they're making that move back to the NAIA. So uh, scholarship is honestly the biggest the biggest piece to this, right, um, for the Yellow Jackets. NAIA gets 24 equivalencies of the school's tuition, which is 24 more than Division Three squads get. So that obviously comes with more of an investment. 
But they'll be the 13th member of the conference and some of the ones that you probably know of um, when it comes to especially football, like teams like Lawrence Tech. Uh, let's see. You look at uh, Siena Heights. Um, trying to think. Other, uh, well, Concordia, who is going to be unfortunately gone, those kind of squads. Uh, but reduced travel, less missed class time are kind of some cited reasons also for that move. It fits the NAI profile, so to speak, is kind of what they've talked about. And um, that's just kind of the news. That, that's really kind of the news. The tough conference. I'm going to show you guys their schedule for this upcoming season before we move on and talk about a couple other teams here. This is the 24 schedule uh, for them. And I mentioned Concordia. This is obviously their last year of uh, a football program operating. That's their opener against Defiance. Then they'll go play St. Francis. You're talking about right off the rip, man. Hey, welcome to NAI. You're going to play two top 20, potentially top 25 teams in the country right off the rip. That hurts. Uh, Judson, Siena Heights, you got Manchester on there. Then here we go again. St. Xavier, tough one. Rose Ullman, you got Madonna, Taylor, Hanover, and then Bluffton to close things out. So they keep a, a D3. I believe Bluffton is D3. That's a D3 opponent on there. But not an easy draw if you are uh, if you're defiance in that first year going back to the NAIA. We'll see uh, what happens for them. But excited for the Yellow Jackets and making that move and uh, joining the NAIA ranks. The next squad we'll talk about, Sol Ross State. We have talked about a little bit on this program. They're Division Three. Well, they were until today. Now they're in the Lone Star Conference at the NCAA Division II level. Big time move for, I believe, is the Lobos, I want to say. It is. It is the Lobos. This is a look at their schedule for 24. And the Lone Star Conference, obviously, no slouch. Once again, Open up with West Texas A&M. That's going to be a tough one. It is a home game for them. You got Eastern New Mexico, Wayland Baptist. You go, you have, you have Western Oregon at home, which is nice. Then here we go into a little bit of a tough stretch. Got Midwestern State, uh, Western. You got Angelo State. Another one against Eastern New Mexico. And you close out the year with the two teams that were in the Lone Star Championship just a year ago at Central Washington and then versus UTPB. Whoo! Going to be tested early and often in this conference. Excited to see what they do. Um, but there was something with this team that I saw on Twitter that I thought you guys, I, I would share with you because I just don't know how I feel about this. Um, this, is a, this is a recruiting deal from them. And you know what? This might be the most Texas recruiting pitch ever. And I love it and hate it at the same time. Looking to get branded? <laughs> that, is the, that is the top sentence. And you've got the recruit photo shoot here, which looks badass, by the way. Great lighting setup and great prop usage here. The SR is flipped, but it's got it literally, for those of you like just listening to this, please pull up YouTube or on Spotify. You can just pull up the video. There is an SR brand in this kid's hand. And the first sentence out of uh, Coach Davis's uh, tweet here is, looking to get branded, question mark. I'm not one on here to come burn bridges. I'm not one to pick apart and, and, and make fun of things, so I'm not going to do that. I just... It just felt a little odd and a little different, like looking to get branded. Is that something that we really want to uh, throw into our vocab and uh, kind of like bring into our, our, pun intended, our brand and our university and our school here? Not a lot of great things associated with branding and, and, and what that comes from and stems from. So that was a little weird for me, but hey. I'm an outside guy. If the guys in that building and the coaches in that building and the recruits and, and everyone around that university and community, if they buy into it, who gives a shit? That's all that matters, right? That's all that matters. At the end of the he also says Brandom at the end. Brandom. Oh, shit. That's something. That is something. We'll move on from that, though, into uh, potentially the best GIF usage out of uh, any recent tweets that I've seen. Roosevelt, the team that we talked about are these three probably the most on this program. They become the 11th member of the GLIAC officially today as of July 1st. This is the tweet from Coach Borkhart. Officially official, the Chicago's Division II team is locked in and ready to make waves in the city. <laughs> and it's Sandlot. Jump in the pool, making waves, making a splash. He's the offensive coordinator over there at Roosevelt. And guess what, Coach? You just earned yourself a follow, good sir. That was uh, that was very good uh, GIF usage. I appreciate that. Here is the uh, the little graphic that the GLIAC put out. 11th member of the GLIAC for Roosevelt. We've talked about 
uh, their schedule. I'll put it up on the screen. We have talked about that earlier, um, so I won't really go through uh, too much in depth, but here is just a look at their schedule as I kind of talk about this move for them. When it comes to their physical location, I mean, you talk about Chicago and the footprint of the GLIAC and where this conference is moving, that's big time. Like, the GLIAC used to have teams... <clears throat> In Illinois, in uh, Ohio, in uh, Indiana, all those other kind of places. Now it's just Michigan, right? It's upper and lower peninsula, but it's just Michigan. So for them to branch back out and extend their footprint out into Chicago, I think is huge for the conference. It's also just great for a conference that has just been admittedly struggling to fill up schedules, which good and bad, right? Good for some teams that want to go out of conference and schedule some big time competition, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for these schools when there's only, what, seven football-playing schools in the conference before Roosevelt's added here. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven schools. Yep, okay, I did a little math there, a little counting. Um, but it's tough when you don't have enough member institutions to fill up a schedule. A lot of conferences don't operate like that. So this is a big-time move for uh, for the GLIAC. They were provisional members in 2022, and now it's, uh, it is officially official. They've been in the NAI for 14 seasons and now they've officially made the jump to NCAA Division 2. They got 14 sports too. Football is not the only one. So they're across, you know, all across the board. So there we go. That's kind of it for today's pod, man. Let me know what you think and uh, looking forward. Hopefully you guys are looking forward to seeing all that content we produced uh, at Alma College just last week. For D1 Rejects, I've been Kobe Manzo. Thanks for tuning in.